get on the 25 at Stratford to come home, you could tell kind of which pocket that you was in along Mile End Road and Bow Road, because Stratford Way, you'd get quite a lot of Africans on the bus. It ain't always good Sometimes we can't give our children And then the African kind of population on the bus would get off. And then it would be um, white East End kind of people from like Stratford to Bow. It's not so bad around here. We're not all small time gangsters. Then you'd get all the little old Jewish women and men who would then get on the bus at Stepney, you know, from like Mile End Stepney, they'd be there. This is a story from around our way. This is a story from around our way. We used to wonder. And then once they were off the bus, then you'd get the Asian um, population who would get on the bus at Whitechapel. Well, they just had to so be more. But you take a look. You know, people would be speaking in their own languages. It was really amazing to watch the change on that little part of that bus route. But it wasn't like, oh, they were there, we were here, they were there, you were there. Everyone was mingled together and people would shout across the bus, you know, because you used to have your conductor then and you could jump on and off the bus. like you was going to see an old friend when you got on the bus because <laughs> you knew exactly what was going to happen and when it was going to happen They would get off at, um, at Allgate, and then whoever was left, you knew, was on the bus going to the West End. And that was like the 25 trip. My parents are from the West Indies. I don't know when they came here, I can't actually remember. But anyway, um, I've got, I think, seven brothers. I can't, I'd have to sit there and do all their names. Something about six or seven. Because the reason I say that is because I wasn't brought up with all of them. So um, every time people ask that, I always struggle with how many I actually have. But I've got two sisters and six or seven brothers. Three of my brothers um, came over when we were younger and lived with us at different times. Funnily enough, I don't remember the feeling that that was odd, which is weird, because if that happened now, I'd be like, oh my God, who are these people coming to live with us? But it, I suppose because we were so young, it didn't really, it just felt like a, a matter of fact, you know, the, this is this person and, and whatever. Um, uh, so my parents came, my mum's brother, came over first from St Lucia in the West Indies and then he sent for my mother and um, she'd already had three children I think in the, the West Indies um, and I think her mother, my grandmother, thought that her life would be um, not wasted but she would move further in life if she um, left basically so she she bought her a ticket um to go on the boat and my mother kind of just left and just went and met my brother and came here um my dad i'm not so sure about i think i'm not so sure about my dad's background i don't think there's anything any drama attached to it but he just came over here i suppose for work like most people 
I don't know if they intended to stay forever. I don't remember ever having that conversation. Well, they but, didn't come um, together though, did they? No, they didn't come together actually. They met, they did meet here. I was born in 1964. So that makes me 40. 46. 46 now. Yep, four years to 50. That's an age, isn't it? That's a proper age. That's what you call an age. Um, and I was born on the Ocean Estate in Stepney. I don't really remember too much about when I was younger. I don't know. I don't Apart know Apart from feeling like you were adopted and Except didn't belong to always, your family. It, yeah, <laughs> that's the running joke in my family that I am adopted because I'm not like them, even though everyone says, oh, you're just like them. And I say, well, yeah, because <coughs> owners and dogs start to become one, don't they? So if I'm with people all the time, of course you I'm going to pick up their mannerisms you are from that and family. Stuff. You're all the same. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, I'm the only one with a dimple and green eyes. I've got two brothers and two sisters. I'm the second eldest, so it's three girls and then two boys. We lived with my mum and dad, and my nan, granddad, and aunt. And then of a weekend... Because that's so much extended family, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. And then of a weekend, my great aunt and my great nan used to come and stay with us from Friday evening to Monday morning. Um, so there's quite a lot of us in a three-bedroom masonette. I don't remember it being squashed. Arguments? I suppose because we was out all the time. Mm. We were always, like the kids, we were always playing out or at school. And then my mum, my aunt, my dad and my granddad were out working. When we came in from school, we used to have to do a bit of cleaning up and get dinner ready. So we all kind of took it in turns and helped out. And it didn't feel like it was a chore. It was just, that's what we did. <clears throat> and my nan used to sit at the table because she was um, housebound. So she couldn't get around too much. So she used to sit at the table. We used to call her shop steward. And she used to tell everybody what they had to do. So someone would have to get potatoes and the meat and then you'd have to cut and cook. and the... So we can all cook, which is a good thing. We can all do... Knitting, household chores, knitting, crochet. crocheting, crochet, yeah. crochet, that's whatever a new word, it's called. crocheting, <laughs> whatever it is, that's what we used to do. And I remember my nan used to sit in a chair, like sit in her armchair like this, and if she had a cup of tea or a plate, she used to sit it on her chest. She'd sit the plate on her chest. <laughs> Chinnery, and I was born in Denmark Street, which is just off Cable Street, in 1933. Well, it was partly bombed, but it was also pulled down as partly slum clearance when they built uh, this estate, St George's Estate, as, as, a, as what was well closed square was pulled down, and uh, Swedenborg Square which was all lovely Georgian houses, and they pulled them all down, where, whereas if they'd have been up the West End, they would have been worth a couple of million quid by now. And they stuck up all the uh, tower blocks in their place. Where I was born, East End then, that was it really poverty stricken, you know, they talk about poverty, you know, they don't know what poverty is. You know, my mother was five of us, and, uh, our father flew the nest, didn't want to know. And uh, we lived on what they called then was the RO, which was a relief, which was a pittance. And I can remember my mother going out and borrowing a penny for, to buy a loaf of bread, you know, that's how bad it was. And uh, before we went to school in those days, there was a mission next to the St George's Town Hall. And we used to go there before we started school, and they'd give us two large slices of bread and jam and a cup of cocoa to go to school with. I say that's how it was in those days.
I was evacuated to Brighton and uh, as I say I went down there in rags and they billeted me with, with this couple in Hamilton Row, I still remember the name, Louise Germain, 18 Hamilton Road and uh, first thing they did they took me down to the department store in Brighton, gloves, uh, over, you never seen a glove, you know, what's this, gloves, overcoat, the lot, underwear, complete, you know, and what well, they were marvellous people, you know, and the Christmas, I, I went there just well, in the October, Christmas, I woke up, uh, never had a toy in my life, there was a pillowcase full of toys, you know, it was marvellous. So I say it didn't last long because I was there 18 months and they decided Brighton was unsafe place to be and they hoofed me off up to, uh, and she wanted to adopt me, the woman, fine enough, yeah, but uh, they hoofed me up to uh, Yorkshire. Before the Blitz finished, I come back, I got back home. I Me and that used to be the great adventure, really. you'd be going around all the bombed houses, that's what we used to play, you know. All, all the houses then hadn't been pulled down or bricked up, and you'd be playing in among all the ruins, you know. Well, that's how it was. Just after the war, 1945 was r really hard because there was shortages of everything. We used to go, I remember there's a school up Prescott Street and they had parquet flooring. It had been bombed, but we'd go and dig up the parquet flooring to burn because it used to be stuck down with tar. And you man, we had them on the fire, you know. And another t other times there was a, a, a boot warehouse that had been bombed. We used to get the old boots, we'd take them home and burn them. And then by the railway, where the trains came along, a certain amount of coal had fallen off the trains. We'd be collecting that. But I've got to say, 1945, 46, it's really a harder time for, you know, than in the war for the shortages. You know, there were absolutely nothing around, you know. two parts in this picture which are one half where there's all buildings and lots of tall flats which are more likely to be busier and noisier but then the other half it's all trees and green greenery and it's really quiet and there's not really much people that would go here but Canary Wharf is more of a busier place where there's more people. Well, my uncle's an artist and he's my inspiration and um, I just love painting and drawing so I want to become even better and be an artist when I'm older, so. I do want to do other things as well. Like, I might want to become a hairdresser, so do my own hair, or design clothes, because I quite like designing. Actually, was my first job. I used to it. work at um, a local theatre, a volunteer actually, at a local theatre called the Half Moon, which is now Weatherspoons. 
And then one of the women who worked at the theatre needed some... She also worked at a place called the German Hospital um, in Hackney and needed some admin staff. So myself and Lizzie um, went and worked there a few hours every... a few days a week for £2 an hour. And I remember thinking, I'm rich. Absolutely rich. I couldn't believe it. I'd do like seven days and I'd get a whole 14 pounds. And I just was like, yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. In a week I could like earn, I don't know, if I did five days, what's that five, four, six, 70 pounds a week. I mean, you were absolutely loaded. And um, so that was fantastic. And we'd just do a little bit of admin, no computery stuff. It was just filling out cards and just pretty rubbish, boring stuff really. And then um, my next job, I suppose, would have been, again, I wouldn't call this a job, but I was in the play at the local, at this same theatre, and that's where I met Debbie, because we were in the same show, and that was called Yak to Yak, and we did a run of that, and, but we didn't get paid. You no, did. didn't we? We got some you kind did. of expenses, did. didn't we? We got expenses. So, yes, yeah, so... Because you weren't equity, so they couldn't pay yeah, you. Yeah, we couldn't pay equity, equity rates, expenses. but they gave us some expenses. Um... That was great. And then after that, um, through the theatre, uh, just hanging out with bands, we then kind of um, unintentionally formed a band because we used to um, sing and hang out and jam with the actors and musicians of the shows. So, um, yes, I was 17 then. And it was just a blast. I just entered this lovely world of creativity and bands and, and they were all much old. Well, then when you're 17, someone who's 25 seems like they're a real adult. And um, so that was just great being open up. I'd stay out. My mum and dad weren't too bothered by it because they knew where I was. I was 17, I'd come home sometimes at two o'clock in the morning. I, it was just fantastic. And, uh, and then we formed a band. Um, somebody asked us, I think we were just singing one day, somebody asked us, oh, are you a band? We were like, yeah, yeah, we're a band. Like you As do. As you do. It was mint juleps, because on our first gig, the guy who ran um, this cabaret club called The Clinker rung up and said, oh, we need a name for the poster. So we were at the other Debbie, Debbie Charles's house, and... Um, we were like, well, we haven't got a name. So we were opening the cupboards and we were going, oh, should we call ourselves Sacks of Salt, Anchor Butter? Uh, salt and Pepper, that salt was already pepper taken. that was already taken. Tate and Lyle, just anything, any of the food things that were in the cupboard. But also we'd been talking about a play that we'd done at school because the other four girls in the band all went to my school and they're all sisters. And a couple of us were in the show that... Um, one of our teachers, Tony <coughs> Graham, um, wrote, he wrote this show, and it was called Dr. Blue's Travelling Show. And in that, I was an overseer, because it was about the southern states of America and slavery and stuff. I was an overseer, and I had to drink mint juleps. So we were just talking about that show and about one of the scenes that I was in. And um, so we said, oh, do you know what? We'll just say mint juleps for today. And it stuck. Let me free. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Whoa, yeah. Whoa, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Whoa, yeah. Go on and set me free. Do, 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 do. Go on and set me free. Do, 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 do. Now, baby, come on and set me free. Do, 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 do. Go on and set me free. Now, baby, yeah. Well, it's a non-stop situation. That's moving up for me. Well, it's a making me mad, making me feel sad, and it's your creeping out of me. But you came into my world with the expectations of a brand new life. But I don't know what you want from me, so come and set me free. When this estate was being built, that's when I just started working in the docks at Tilbury Docks. 
And I used to go by on the trains past this estate every day when they were building it. Never thought I'd finish up here because I lived in that time in Cartwright Street near the tower, which were old tenement blocks. That was in the 1960s when this was built, I should think, 1960s. This had been built 40 years, this estate, because we moved in when it was first built into the tower blocks. been here for 20, 21 or 22 years. Prior to that, I had lived in Tradica Square, as I said, from when I was four years old, I think we moved to Tradica Square. Yeah, I would have been about 21 when we moved here. And I must admit, when I first came here, because it's a tower block and... Um, it's the 20th floor. It's the 20th floor, <laughs> yeah, it's really high. <laughs> Um, but you had to kind of, not not just because of the stigma, but there was the thing about tower blocks, it really wasn't like thing. But I just didn't like the idea of living in, you know, in a building like this and up so high. And I'd come from a nice, what you would consider to be a posh, posh. square now. Yeah, yeah it posh, was. I mean, it's, a con it's part of the conservation <laughs> area. I don't know if it was always a conservation area. I don't know how th all of that works, but basically... <laughs> It, Tradica Square is part of a conservation area and they are very nice houses so when you've come from that and even though most people I know weren't living in squares and most people did live in flats I didn't know anybody had lived in a tower block when you're only 21 um, you think oh god and I remember my brother living in one and actually it's funny because I didn't want to live in one but I do remember thinking it was highly amusing that my brother lived in one and I couldn't wait to go in there just to see what it was like to go into this other world of the tower block um <laughs> the world of the tower block, the tower block. <laughs> and really it's a world I really don't mind settled in quite nicely yeah it's good <laughs> Canary Wharf because it's more busier and there's more people around because staying in Mudchute Farm there's not really much you can do because there's Canary Wharf which has everything like shops um, restaurants there's cinemas there's a lot of things you can do There's cinemas everywhere. I mean, you went along Commercial Road, you had the Palaceum uh, next to Watney Street, you had the Troxy, then just past the Troxy you had the Poplar, and opposite the Poplar you had the Ben Hur just up White Horse Lane there. Everywhere there were cinemas. You had a big cinema in uh, Whitechapel there, the, uh, the Astoria, which was bombed when the church was bombed. The, uh, St Mary's Church was bombed in the war, you know, which is called Aspally Park now. But that was all that was all bombed in the war, you know. You're 
theory of a mastermind, your mysterious Mike O'Shea, the chuckling crook behind all this, is just film stuff. Mike O'Shea doesn't exist. Good night. And I do hope, Miss Redmayne, that you're going to have a better night than I think you are. Why? What do you mean? Mumsy thinks there's something queer about this house. Mumsy knows it, darling. <laughs> In the early 80s, the cabaret circuit was just massive. Every... The whole life circuit, yeah, wasn't it? Every pub, anywhere that had a spare room was part of the cabaret circuit. Something would be going on, like literally. And we would sometimes be playing three gigs a night because there was just millions of places to play. Oh, it's you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't run out of venues to um, turn up and perform at. So anyway, people started calling us up like, immediately to come and do gigs. And we were like, oh, no, we can't do gigs. We're not even a band. So anyway, we just thought, oh, come on then, let's just go and have a laugh. Not thinking that we'd get paid or anything. And anyway, somebody phoned us up at the Half Moon, because me and Debbie used to work at the Half Moon. And um, somebody called us up at the Half Moon and said, oh, uh, uh, can I speak to somebody who deals with the mint tulips? And we were like, <laughs> oh, shit, it's official. We <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, uh, we're just wondering if you can perform at our venue and blah, blah, blah. And how much do you charge? Well, I remember the first day somebody asking me how much we charged. I shat myself. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? How much do we charge? We can't charge for this. You're joking. So Debbie was in the box office with me and I was going, how much do we charge? And she's like, what, what? I'm going, how much did you charge? Was it like 25 quid or 30 quid? 30 quid. 30 quid. We thought we were really taking the piss, <laughs> asking for 30 quid, right? But we thought, come on, let's go for it. They might say, yeah, and if they say no, it don't matter. We'll just say, like, 20 then. I said, 30 quid, right? And she went, oh, OK, that's fine. And, of course, I just thought, shit, I could have asked for 50. <laughs> that's right. So we'd turn up at the gig, do our gig, have our drinks between us, get a cab with that 30 quid to the next venue that we were playing at. And that's how we would do it. Mm. Just like, it wasn't to make money, it was just so we could have drinks at that venue and get a cab to the next venue we were well, playing at. Because it was at. just a laugh, wasn't mm. it? It was almost like part of your social life rather than a job. It was just like, oh yeah, we're going out tonight, what are you doing? Doing a gig. Yeah. And, and, then, <laughs> and then we put the price up. We were going, come on, let's try and, let's see if we can put the price up. We went up. to 100, didn't we? We went to 100 pounds straight away. And it's <laughs> the first time I said 100 pounds, I couldn't even get it out. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And I was at my nan's on the phone. And I remember leaning on the fridge, because the fridge was in front of the phone on the wall. And I remember leaning on the fridge going, 100 pounds? And they went, yeah, fine. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. You got 100 pounds, can't believe it. And so we were doing gigs for 100 pounds. So we had spending money as well, you know, money we, we could keep in our pockets. We are like, Especially if we were doing like two or three mm. sometimes, we'd have like 300 quid, that'd yeah. be 50 pounds yeah. each. And then we, you know. then we started getting television companies calling up, saying, oh, can you do the Wogan show? Can you do the Tube? Can you do this? And when it was the, um, when the televisions and radio started calling up, then we were thinking, God, this is proper, isn't it? This is right it took us a while to realise it yeah. was proper. Yeah, it did. <laughs> this was all in like a year, I suppose. Yeah. And then our break into the record industry was when Virgin were doing their first flight, their inaugural flight. Yeah, we did. And the uh, they asked flight. us, we went to the uh, Virgin offices and they wanted us to audition. Although um, we didn't realise it was an No, audition. but they d actually, they didn't tell us it no, was they an audition. Just said, they just said, can you come can and you come sing? Along? We just want to see you cause for this thing anyway. And then we found out it was for the Virgin to sing on the plane. Would and you believe? Richard Branson was With there. With Richard Branson there. They had all these celebrities on the celebrities of the the time, um, and we all got on the plane and basically partied all the way from London to New York. <laughs> and all <laughs> the, the time plane. in New York and all the way back. And then all the way back. <laughs> hey girl. Boom.